Welcome to Hannah United Methodist Church's online worship for February 28, 2021. Such a time to celebrate that as the virus has come under control a little bit, the 28th, we resume in-person worship for those who are able to attend, who feel that it is safe for them to attend. And of course, because we aren't completely free of the virus yet, we will continue to social distance and wear masks. But unless the situation changes drastically, uh, we will continue to worship in person. So let us pray that God continue to protect us, continue to bring this difficult time to a close. And let us also pray for all of those who are not able to come to worship with us in person, for you who are online this day, that you soon may be able to rejoin the community of faith in person. We thank you so much for your continued faithfulness in all the ways that we walk with Christ, with our witness, with our service, with our prayers, with our working on our own discipleship and our own relationship with Jesus Christ, and with our continued faithfulness in giving to the church and to the mission of the church. We have a lot of things planned for this coming year, and we hope and pray that as the situation improves with the virus, that we may go forth with great power and do more for God, for the kingdom of God, with the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of your faithfulness. So thank you very much. And let us now prepare our hearts to worship by opening with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you walk with us. We thank you that your presence is never gone. We know that there are times when it does not feel to us like you are with us, but you are more faithful than we could ever imagine, than we could ever be. So we thank you for your presence. And during this time of worship, we pray that you make your presence aware to us with power, with depth, so that we might experience your love, all for Jesus' sake in whose name we pray. Amen. And let us now sing our opening hymn, Stand Up and Bless the Lord. as a community of faith where the love of Christ dwells in our personal relationships with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors, but also with all those people that God is sending us to serve and to witness to. We include all of them in this time of prayer. We pray for the entire world 
for its healing. And that through this difficult time, perhaps, just perhaps, God can send forth his people so that all the world might know the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And out of that hope, we gather our prayers together. Let us pray today, especially for those who are sick and suffering from the pandemic and all the other illnesses that still remain with us, for all of those who care for the sick and dying, for those who have grown weary of all of the precautions that we have to take, whose hearts have begun to close, for those who see no hope, for those who see no way forward. Let us pray for them that they might trust in the good plans that God has for us. Let us also pray for Glenn and Rita, for Alan, for Sandy, for Stephen, Brittany, and Grant, Tony, Linda, Tom and Bev, Jim and Judy, Greg, Joy, Judy, Don, Susie, Bill, Buddy, Brenda, and Gloria. Let us lift up all of these people and situations to the Lord in prayer, as well as all of those things that are known to us in our minds and hearts. Let us pray. God of healing and grace, we stand here, we sit here, we exist here in a state of brokenness, in a state of doubt, in a state of worry. And yet because of the good news of Jesus Christ, even in our distress, you give us hope, you give us purpose, and you are sending us forward to the place that you will show us so that we might serve you wherever you send us, so that we might praise you in all situations, so that we might stand on your grace every day in every way. We know, Lord, that you are leading us. We ask that your spirit guide us so that we can find the way. We know, Lord, that your mission is for us to go into the world and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to proclaim life and to proclaim liberty and freedom from all that would hold us down. We also know, Lord, that you have not promised us that every day would be perfect. You have not promised us that there would be no trials. But what you have promised us is your presence with us throughout the trials, and the strength of your spirit to help us to not only endure the trials, but to be witnesses to the faithfulness that you have given us as we follow your way. May our hearts be filled with your love, and may that love shine forth through our lives so that others might desire to journey with us on the path that you set before all of us. We pray, Lord, for the healing that you give in whatever form it comes. We pray, Lord, for the comfort that you give, and we pray especially, Lord, for those who are so distant from you that they can no longer see you or hear your voice. Help us, Lord, to help them. Help us to bring them the grace of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and verses 15 and 16. Hear the word of God speaking to us through the words of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. We seek your presence today. We seek your word. We desire understanding. And we want to experience the covenant that you have made with our ancestors and with us. Open our minds and open our hearts that we might not only hear, but that we might be moved to follow to walk in the way that you would have us to go, by the light of your word, by the power of your spirit, and with the presence of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So today, on the second Sunday of Lent, we continue with our Lenten worship series, Rend Your Hearts, where we are looking at the multiple times that God has renewed the covenant that God made with his creation. Last week, we focused on the covenant that God made with Noah, and today we're going to be talking about the covenant that God made with Abram, or Abraham. And just as a reminder, a covenant is an agreement between two parties where one party is much more powerful than the other, and the covenant is not like a contract where if one party violates the terms, the contract is null and void. No, a covenant remains in effect, even if one party breaks the covenant. And human beings have broken the covenant time and time and time and time and time again. But God is faithful and God has kept the covenant. And God has renewed the covenant with us in so many ways at so many times so that we would know the everlasting nature of God's covenant with us. That no matter what we do, God continues to be our God. We continue to be his creation. God loves us. And so God renews the covenant, places the covenant before us in new ways. But it's always been the same covenant, the covenant that God will be our God and that we will be God's people. And that covenant was made purely, plainly, completely evident in Jesus Christ. But as we journey through the Old Testament, looking at the different renewals of the covenant, we are reminded that we too need to renew that covenant relationship frequently, daily. 
but the covenant remains in force. God's love for us is steadfast, and we are always welcome home when we just turn and go in that way. So let's talk about our scripture today. Um, to begin with, 41.4135222410888366, comma, negative 86.7821 one eight zero nine three six seven four one four seven. No, this isn't a math lesson. Those are latitude and longitude numbers that identify a place on the globe. That particular place that those long numbers identify is Hannah United Methodist Church. And if somebody were looking at a map and had those coordinates, they would know right where I'm standing. They would be able to identify this place. But if they didn't have a map, they would have no idea where those numbers referred to, even if they recognized that they were a latitude and a longitude. Sometimes, the things that identify us aren't so clear. They aren't so obvious. Even the name Hannah United Methodist Church, that also identifies this place and this people, us. It tells us that it's in a place called Hannah and that it's a United Methodist Church. And that refines our identity a little bit, but if you weren't familiar with northern Indiana, you'd probably have no idea where Hannah was. And United Methodists come in a whole variety of different theologies and politics and in communities and ways of worshiping and ways of singing all over the world. So Hannah, United Methodist Church, it identifies us a little bit but you wouldn't really know who those people at Hannah United Methodist Church were just from that name, just from that identifier. I myself have a name, Jim Denton, or James. And that name can tell somebody who had the knowledge a bit about me, perhaps, the name James is a French version of the Latin and Hebrew Jacob. And Jacob as a name means one who grabs the heel or one who crushes under his heel. It refers to Jacob who, when being born with his twin Esau, grabbed a hold of his brother's heel while they were being born seeking to pull Esau back and get ahead of him. Well, I hope that doesn't describe my character. And the name Denton, it's an English name that refers to Dunn's town. And a Dunn in Old English was a small valley. So the name Denton refers to people who were from a town in a small valley in northern England. But that doesn't describe me either. I've never been to England, let alone come from there. And rather than being from a town in a small valley, I'm from a town that was on top of a large moraine from which you could see 30 miles to the north and the south spreading out below this town in a gentle slope. Rather than being a valley, it was really the opposite. My name tells you nothing about me. It doesn't tell you where I'm from. It doesn't tell you my character. But one name that we are given should tell people all they need to know. And that name is 
the name of Jesus Christ. Because when we are incorporated into God's family through our baptism and our profession of faith, we were given the name Christian. Christian, follower of Christ. And that name should be sufficient to tell anybody about who we are about what's important in our life, about how we live that life. In our scripture today, Abram, Sarai, and even God are given new names. The name Abram means a father. The name Abraham means the father of nations. The name Sarai means my princess. The name Sarah means princess of the nations. And it's hard to see it in English, but God is given a new name in this passage also. Where our scripture said, I am God Almighty. What that's actually saying in Hebrew is, El Shaddai. You might be familiar with the song, El Shaddai. And it means God Almighty. And this passage in Genesis is the first time that God is referred to as El Shaddai. In this covenant that God is making with Abram and Sarah, or Abraham and Sarah, they all get new names because it represents a new relationship. When we are given the name Christian, that represents a new relationship also. And if we are faithful to the name that is given us, the world won't know lots of details about us, but hopefully they will know who we are, how we're going to interact with them, what a relationship with us would be like because we bear the name Christian. Abraham indeed became the father of many nations, and Sarah was indeed the princess of many nations. And God is indeed the Lord God Almighty. All of these things with the names, even the location, they're about identity. And they're about conveying to the world something about our character. As Christians, we follow Jesus Christ. Just like Abraham or Abram followed God's instruction when God told Abram to take his family, and go to a new place that God would show him. And out of faith, Abram gathered up his family and left his home, traveled many, 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 many miles to a place that he didn't know where he was going. That place turned out to be Canaan. But I don't believe that the Latitude and longitude of the place that Abraham went to was what was important. The place that God was leading Abraham to was less a place on the map than it was a place of trust, a place of faith, a place of of willingness to obey. And when Abraham and his family had reached the place where that wandering in a strange land, where they had no land, they had no property, they had no way to support themselves except for what they brought with them. But they had their trust in God. That was the place that God was leading Abram to. It's not about a land on a map. It's about a relationship with God that trusts God to lead, that trusts that God will be with us wherever we go. And it's about having an identity as people 
who have that kind of trust in God. So as we bear the name of Christ, the name Christian, we too are called to go where God will send us, trusting in God, not knowing where the future will lead us, not knowing what will happen, not knowing what we will be called upon to do, but knowing in all of it that God is with us, that we are in relationship. And because we bear that name, we have a witness to the world. It's been a difficult year, more difficult than most, but we all have difficulties. We all have challenges every year, all the time. In this past year, we may have felt like we have lost our way. We may have doubted how this will end, when will this end, and we may fear that our church, our community, that our very selves will continue to suffer because of all that has happened and all that has not happened in the past year. But God has been with us every step of the way, and God is with us today. And God will be with us when we go forward into the future. And we may not know the coordinates of what that future is going to bring, but we can be absolutely certain that God is blessing us, that God has been blessing us, and that God will continue to bless us. We will fail, we will falter, we will lose our way. Abraham and Sarah made many mistakes, but they walked before God in faith. So let us walk before God with that same faith and trust that God has a future for us and trust that we too can bring many people, nations, to know the good news of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. to live the call this week. Focus on your Christian walk. Pay attention to the travel, the journey that God has you and us on. And we don't know the destination. We don't know the future except for our ultimate future to be with God for all eternity. But we do know that the path the faithfulness to God is the path of the disciple, the path of discipleship. And to practice our discipleship, to grow in discipleship, it's really a very practical matter, a lot like a journey, putting one foot in front of the other. But the path of discipleship is about daily prayer and devotion. Studying the scripture, not just with the head, but with the heart. The path of discipleship involves learning to serve others. Learning to reach out to people, not because they deserve it, but because of the grace of God. It's about faithfulness and worship. It's about speaking of godly matters with other people both when evangelizing, but also when just sharing your own struggle, your own heart with somebody who you are close to, a faithful faith friend. It's about being in mission in the world, practicing the means of grace. The last year has severely disrupted so many of our familiar patterns of discipleship. And perhaps, perhaps that can be a good thing. Not just will it make us appreciate the opportunities for discipleship more, but it has also opened us up to a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God so that we can carry that one-on-one -on -one relationship to others. But the path to get to that place, that place of faithfulness, is the path of practicing discipleship, growing in our faith intentionally, 
with work and effort. Just like Abram had to put one front in front of the one foot in front of the other as he made a long, long journey to a place that he didn't know where. We do the same in our discipleship journey. As we resume worship and as things return more and more to normal, when we can gather fully and less restrictively, we as a church are going to be focusing on growing in discipleship very intentionally. And from there, we're going to carry our discipleship out into the world with power, with love, with intention. And that begins this week as we live the call to practice discipleship. Let us pray. Covenant-keeping God, we continue to believe that you are at work in our lives and in the world. Help us to rend our hearts and give us the eyes to see hope when we are tempted to despair. Give us reassurance of your presence, even during times when we feel that we are stumbling in the dark. May our lives be a witness to those around us of your faithfulness. May our identity as your people be as clear as the lives that we live. Help us, Lord, to practice the journey of discipleship, that our identity as Christian may be complete and may be pleasing to you. El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty, we give you thanks and praise for the journey that you are sending us on. Amen. Let us now sing our closing hymn, The God of Abraham Praise. My friends, my fellow family who journey on the path that God has set us on, as you go into your world, into your lives, 
trust that God is with us. And even if we don't know the destination in all of its details, even if we can't mark it on a map, physical map or a metaphorical map, know that God is with us. Know that we have been given a new name, a new identity. And as we work together to live into that identity, that identity becomes contagious. And we can have more and more people join us on this journey so that all the world may one day know the God of the covenant of love, of life, of Christ. So go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and live lives that build up our discipleship. Live lives that witness to the identity, not just of who we are, but the identity of the one who lives in us, our Lord Jesus Christ. Have a blessed week.